schooling in progress. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Hamwood Live. Hope everybody's doing good today. Give it a few minutes. Got a handful of people still joining in. And I will say I apologize if my daughter starts crying. She's in her car seat behind me. So that's possible. She's asleep right now, but it's possible she wakes up. Hope everybody's having a great week, kind of back to work. This week should have been a little more normal than I guess the last last week. But as always, if you guys have any um, questions right off the bat, go ahead and either raise your hand and we'll unmute you or go ahead and start typing a few questions in the chat and we'll we'll start hashing some things out. We know there's probably a handful of folks that are new to this um, live. This is probably your first time joining in, uh, whether it's just your first time in general or just you just bought the program right after Christmas. We welcome you as well. And we're excited to see the results that you guys are going to see just from going through this program. So fire away, folks. And for those of you that are new, uh, like I said, this is a space for us to come together once a week for you to ask questions. So I want to make sure that you're doing the drills properly. So don't be shy to ask any type of question inside of this group. All right, we want to make sure that you're doing the drills correctly and that you're getting the results that you're looking for over these 30 days. I've encountered a lot of people that are shy and don't want to ask questions. Please don't be one of them. Absolutely. Um, first one here, question um, says, how should I use the program as a switch hitter? I Again, the switch hitters are great. I'm always going to, if a kid is a switch hitter, we're going to start on their dominant side first and make sure that we go through the program, train them, I mean, their knowledge of the swing, their mechanics from that side. And then once they get a good grasp of their dominant side, then we'll take time and go back into their non-dominant side. You have to be careful with this because you can, you can spend more time on one than you do the other or vice versa, and it can cause one side to suffer. Um, so again, if you're going that route, that's great. I mean, kudos to that kid, but make sure that you, I mean, solidify this swing before moving on to the next swing. Then it's just going to be a matter of maintaining. Now, I've dealt with a couple of switch hitters that were going through the program, and I see a lot of the issue is, like, in the program, say you have 100 swings that day. They do 50 from one side, 50 mm -hmm. from another side, and we cannot do that. All right, if we're going to switch it, it's 100 swings from one side, it's 100 swings from the other. You have to do the program and complete swings on both sides. And the reason for that is because we're trying to build that muscle memory and that consistency during that swing. And that's how we're going to do that is through repetition. So you don't want to cut it in half. You want the full workout from one side and do the full workout on the other. Yeah. Very good. Another one here um, from Jim. My 14-year-old son is having some issues with barring his arm during some of the exercises. Any suggestions on how to present or how to prevent this as it makes him sometimes come around the inside of the ball instead of through it. Um, that's going to be from them just getting tight and wanting to attack the ball more with this part of their body. A lot of kids that have that lock that arm out, they pull off extremely bad because that's the only way that they can get their hands back inside the ball. So my guess is that he's having trouble keeping his hands in. Um, kids that go this way, I go straight to here. Tell them we've got to go forward. Trey talks about the hand has to go to the pitcher. If I do this, my hand doesn't go to the pitcher. It goes to the catcher, and that's a negative move. We've got to stay straight. We've got to stay short and direct to where we're trying to go. So have them keep the hands right over the shoulder, right in between the ear and the shoulder, and the first move has got to be driving inside the ball towards the pitcher. The other thing is a lot of it's mental. Like I said, I, I deal mm -hmm. a lot with the mental side of these drills. It's what is the player thinking while he's doing the drill? And uh, a lot of kids that arm bar, they're thinking of swinging the bat. Right. Well, during the drill, we're not, we're not swinging the bat. We're pulling our hands inside mm -hmm. the ball. So mentally, if you're thinking, okay, I just want to drive my hand towards the pitcher as far as I can, and that's it, then he's going to stay inside that ball, and he's not going to arm bar. Mm -hmm. Very That's good. I would, I would ask him, what is he thinking? And then try to try to change his mindset of, okay, I just want to relax the hands and drive the hands as far as I can towards the pitcher and stay inside yeah. that ball. Yeah, very good. 
Russell here says some pro hitters finish low and some finish high. What is our reason for finishing low? Thank you. Um, obviously, we always talk about line of the pitch. So if I'm dealing with this is the catcher and this is the pitcher, the line that I'm going to have is going to be somewhat like this. It's not going to be exactly flat because the guy's standing on the mound. Um, if you're a softball, it's going to be a little flatter than baseball. But again, the line that we're dealing with is very close to level in a sense. So we want to match that plane and stay level with that plane. If you're finishing high, that means your barrel's following the plane. And then right before you get to the end of the line, your barrel's coming out of the zone. So if you're early, they fool you on a curveball or whatever the case is, you're, bar you're never going to you're never going to make contact. You've put it, put yourself in a position to where you had to be dead on time to make good contact. We finish low, so we keep our barrel in line with that ball all the way through the zone rather than having it snatch up out of the zone. And I know um, I've gotten in the cage with Gregor Blanco. If you don't know Blanco, he's a two-time World Series champion with the Giants. And a lot of the uh, Hispanic players are, have always been taught finish high. But the thing is with those guys, when they do finish high, they get to full extension first, and then they finish up. Mm -hmm. uh, the main issue with the finishing high is that you finish high too early before complete extension. And like Jonathan said, you're driving the barrel of your bat out of the zone too early, which means your timing has to be perfect in order to uh, barrel the ball up and square it up. So the reason we finish low is because we want the barrel of our bat to stay in the zone throughout the entire swing. So at the beginning of the swing, all the way through extension. And the way that we solidify that is by finishing low. Mm -hmm. Very, and, I mean, again, we're not knocking one way or the other. We believe finish low just because, I mean, you're, once you get into that finish high, you're dealing with athleticism at that point. Some of those Dominican guys, they are extremely athletic that they can keep both hands on the bat and get the full extension through the zone and then release that top hand and finish high. Not every kid's able to do that. So we teach them the most consistent way. And as they grow, as they improve, if they're able to get to that point, then fantastic. Um, the next question, kind of the same, same deal, one hand or two hand finish. We preach a one hand finish just because of the fact that we're going to have more extension with our bottom hand than you would with your top hand if i do this i'm turning my body now which means my bottom hand if i'm at full extension and i start turning my body my hand goes wrong direction i need to stay here so i release that top hand naturally through the zone again not right or wrong one way or the other i've finished two hands my entire career and was able to hit 300 for a period of time had I known what I know now, I would have much rather finished one-handed. Um, but when I worked off the tee and things like that, I always had a one-hand finish to teach myself and train my mechanics that I want to stay in that zone and I want to release that bat naturally and not force the top hand through there. Yeah, that's the big thing is uh, people that leave their top hand on the bat, I'm sure you've heard the term top hand dominant. So, mm -hmm. um you know, if you do it improperly, it's going to cause rollovers. So you're going to be more dominant with the top hand. You're going to roll right over the pitch. So yeah. whenever you release top hand, not only do you get better extension, which leads to more power, you catch the ball out front, mm -hmm. but um, it's also going to limit uh, you rolling over the ball, okay? Because right. you're not going to be top hand dominant if that hand is coming off the bat at contact. So those are two main keys as to why we do that. And you see 95 or 95 plus percent of the, you know, major league players all finish one hand. Yeah. And it's for that reason. It's for the top hand or for that extra extension out front. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can, you can kind of spend some time there. I mean, I see a lot of folks doing drills nowadays where they keep both hands on the bat and they're real stiff and holding that finish, keeping their feet in the ground. And all they're doing is stopping the speed of the bat as it's wanting to whip through the zone. So like you say, the top hand is just going to cause you to roll over. It's also going to slow your bat down coming through the zone because you're not letting it naturally release. There's tension here. That top hand is still wanting to stay on it. We've got to just let that bottom hand keep driving, let that top hand naturally come off and feel that bat whip through the zone. I said, I know the, uh, with me, I'm sure Jonathan can attest to it too, is uh, a few of my hits in college – I've been so I've been fooled and I was so far out front. I was still able to barrel it and hit doubles into the gaps because I was able to get that extra extension out front. Mm -hmm. If my top hand stayed on the bat, I never would have got to reach out to hit, that yeah. pitch and still able to drive it. You'd have been off the end of the bat, or you'd have, I mean, you would have caught it in the middle of your rollover. There was no way to yep, keep or your top swing hand and a miss. Up. Yeah, through that, <laughs> yeah, through that ball. 
I mean, we hit with a player today that's, I mean, kind of the same thing. And I posted something on Instagram the other day that was kind of talking about that top hand stuff. And a lot of folks, I mean, they want to be powerful and they think it comes from here, but they don't realize the exact position that it's putting your hand in when you're literally going through the zone. I mean, a lot of folks that have their palm doing drills like this, driving down their bat, going in a vertical position through the zone. And that doesn't make any sense in regards to what we're trying to do. We're trying to make contact in this line. So I've got to keep that top hand loose and not force it. As soon as I turn it, bat goes up and over the ball. So I've got to keep that palm up and let it whip through there. Another question, my son is 12, he swings, um, he has, hang on, swing has his from front foot roll over slightly, toes point backwards towards the pitcher, but the front foot rolls over on its side. Can we, or should we correct this? I'm assuming you're talking about the front foot kind of getting more in this position, rolling over. Um, I, I'm after show you what contact, I'm, I'm assuming. That's what I'm like thinking. Forces. Is that we're kind of getting yeah. into this this position? Tell me yes yeah. or no. Plant foot, yes. Okay, that to me is going to be where the pressure is. A lot of kids that have that issue, they get too much pressure on the outside of their foot. We've got to be firm in that front leg. I tell kids that once that front foot lands, it's got to land soft. And as we fire our backside, our knee and hip, we've got to feel that front side firm up as we go through contact. We don't want a lot of this or weak on that front leg. We've got to keep pressure on the inside of that foot right here as we firm it up through there, through contact. After you get through contact, if it goes to this position, I mean, you're, I mean, ball's gone. You're through the zone. What, I mean, it is what it is at that point. But we don't want that foot to not be solid when they get ready to start their swing through there. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If it's like if it's after contact, you know, all the force of the swing kind of making it roll right. out, then I, that's really not a big issue. Uh, but if it's during the swing, then yes, that needs to be fixed. So if you could tell us whether it's during the swing or after the swing or after the contact, then um, that'd be a lot more helpful. Or seeing a video of it too. Like if, yeah. if you have a video of it, send it to that text hotline and we'll be able to uh, get that uh, question answered for you. Very good, guys. Any others? Keep them coming. And, John, if you go in there uh, into the membership site, you should see the text hotline number. So all you got to do is just text that number, uh, the video, and we'll be able to look at it and critique it. Yep, you'll that be goes me. for all of you. All of you have access to that texting hotline. So, uh, you know, if you have videos of them doing the drills, just send it to the hotline. We'll be able to tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. Anybody else? I have some folks popping in here too. I'll say we uh, while we wait for another question. Um, the Miami Marlins called yesterday. Yeah, they more they they want some bats. So that's good. Hopefully, I'll be able to go out there and do some videos with them. Yep, they will get Jeter. That'd be a good one. Jeter, man, stay inside. Give yourself more yeah, time. Do it. That's the biggest thing, too, guys. I mean, as we take kids through this program, we're constantly reminding them of how this is literally playing into your swing. I mean the mechanics that we're teaching you are giving you more time to make solid contact. So you dealing with players or your players or I mean players on your team or whatever that don't necessarily really want to give this a try or they don't really want to buy into what you're saying. I mean, just stay on them because eventually they're going to do something that you say and they're going to see the result. We deal with that all the time. Players come in here and they go through half a lesson and you can kind of look in their eyes and tell that they think I'm the dumbest man alive. But again, until somebody convinces me that the fastest distance between two points is not a straight line, we're going to keep teaching what we teach. And we're going to keep knowing what we know. That if we can stay in that line and the kids can learn that knowledge and those mechanics, at that point, all it is is keeping your muscle memory intact. It's not, it's not a big strenuous thing. I mean, Trey, you could attest that once you got through this and kind of got into your season, it wasn't like you had to take so much time and so much effort to keep your swing in line. Yeah. Like I said, 
I mean, whenever I first started this program, my hitting coach, Frank, is the one that taught me all this. And he was working with me. And I was going through the drills and all that stuff. And, um, you know, I was looking good in the cage. But I would get into the game and I would just revert right back to what I was doing, you know, trying to pull the ball and all that. And I said, Frank sat me down one day after about two months of us working together. And he sat me down and said, if you don't start focusing on what I'm trying to teach you in the cage, in the games, I'm going to completely stop working with you. Because Frank's Mm -hmm. approach is always, and it's what I did throughout my entire career was look for the fastball away to drive away and react to anything inside. Well, mm-hmm. Frank noticed that I was not thinking away. I was thinking pull because I was pulling off of everything. So that day he sat me down and said, if you don't focus on this approach at the plate, I'm going to stop working with you. Mm-hmm. And that game, I hit a double off the right center field wall. And at that moment, it clicked. Like, okay, I don't have to pull the ball in order to have power, right? Mm-hmm. I can hit the ball out to right field as just as easy as I can in the left field. And yeah. whenever I had that realization is when this really clicked for me and I became an all American two years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a couple other questions here, any drills for kids on the younger side? My son is 10. We have a camo bat, one hander and the pro T the hands drills. Always. Those are the easiest drills truthfully yeah. to start a kid off with the one hander and the two hander. So if you have those bats, just jump into the one hand drill and the two hand drill. Um, that is going to be, the best thing for him it's going to train muscle muscle memory and good mechanics I mean, right off the bat yeah and if you're since you're in this group you have access to the program so um you know with the younger kids we always want to make sure that their hands are developed before we move on to another aspect before we move on to the lower half we want to make sure that the, the the hands are developed and consistent so uh you know whenever i'm working with a young player say a six or seven or eight year old you know, I might put a little extra emphasis on the hand drills. We might do the hand drills for two or three weeks straight before we mm-hmm. even get into the lower half. All right. So we want to make sure the hands are consistent before we move on to the lower half because we don't want to add too many variables to confuse a player, if that makes sense. So yeah. um, the one hand drill, uh, no feet, no shoulders with the big bat. Those are the two drills that we want to start off with. Get consistent with that. And then we move on to teaching the lower half. Um, right here, Patrick says, can you please uh, explain the front foot land and plant when you want, where you want pressure with the ground force through the swing again? Yes, we want to keep pressure inside of our feet, truthfully. We never want to feel pressure getting to the outside of our legs out here. We want to keep it in here. So the pressure of our feet, we've got to keep pressure on the inside of that front foot. We can't let it get to there. And like I was saying earlier, we just have kids fire the knee and hip and firm the foot up at contact you saw how i went to the outside there my foot went right there so i have a tendency to leak on that front side but if i can firm up the inside of that boom i'm going to be a lot more solid and have a lot more power i mean again it's like it's like hitting somebody and punching them and punching through them and hitting somebody and punching them and falling over you're going to have a lot more power if there's a little bit of resistance against that front side than you are if you're over the top of it yeah, I'm sure you always hear that term fight against that front side. So whenever uh-huh. you're whenever you're rotating against the stiff front side, you're gonna create more I don't know the I guess the word would be torque, like power. torque, maybe. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's what, that's what I was thinking. Torque of just like whipping through the zone is right. gonna create that extra power. Yeah, very good question there. Um, kids were super thrilled for all their camel gear at Christmas. That's awesome. That's awesome. Keep us posted on the I, I love those videos. Oh, yeah. Um, I know this program is for power, but I also have trouble with contact. I don't hit many line drives, even though I have the power. Um, How do I fix this to get more powerful line drives? Truthfully, I'll tell you this, what I've learned through teaching this, and even my career, Trey would tell you I didn't have weight shift in my swing. I had a lot of rotation, and that's all I did was just squash the bug. That's what I was taught. But once I kind of transformed my swing after I, I started working through this program and learning how weight shift really happens, you're basically creating force from underneath the ball through the ball. The only way for the ball to go in the air, if you throw it, is to apply force from the bottom. If you apply force from the top, it's going to go straight down in the ground. So if you're having trouble hitting the ball in the air, it's probably because your hands are leading the swing. 
and you're driving that barrel down at the ball, you've got to reprogram, and this program is going to do it if you get into weeks um, two and three. We've got to really focus on what our lower half is doing and starting the swing with the lower half and letting what happens with the bat almost be, a, I mean, just a result of what your lower half's doing. It's a byproduct. This is the whip. Once you train the hands, this is just whipping through the zone. We have to use that lower half to get it through there. So if you want to hit more balls yeah, in the air, have... go ahead, Trey. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, I don't know if it did he specify he's hitting too many ground balls or he's hitting too many pop ups. Um he's if saying if you put him in the chat. I don't hit many line drives. Um my guess is that you're hitting a lot of ground balls. Can he let us know though, type buddy. in the chat and let us know? Yeah, it'd be a if we know if, if you're hitting primarily ground balls, it's completely different than if you're hitting pop ups. Yeah. If you'll let us know. But anyway, if you're hitting a lot we'll of ground on. balls, like Jonathan said, yeah. it's because you're rolling over. Um, mostly ground balls is mostly because you're rolling balls. over on your swing. So your top hand's dominant, you're forcing the barrel down on the ball, mm -hmm. whereas we want to focus on just our hands. All right. So don't think about swinging the bat. Just think about driving your hands and letting the barrel naturally follow, okay? So when you're doing these drills, say you're just hitting off of a tee, go through your whole stance, you're loading all that, and just focus on driving your hands past the inside of the ball towards the pitcher. That's the only thing I want you thinking about, just how hard can I drive my hands past the inside of the ball towards the pitcher? And you'll be surprised that barrel will whip through the zone naturally. It'll be a line drive almost every time. So – if you're hitting ground balls, it's because you're swinging down on the ball. You're uh, top hand dominant. If you're hitting a lot of pop ups, it's because uh, the angle of which your bat's coming through the zone, you're uppercutting too much, aka you're creating a loop in your swing. Mm -hmm. So um, the way you fix that is just to focus on driving the hands down through the ball um, off the tee and all that while doing the drills. Very good there. Um, another question is kids are 10 and 12. They started day one last week. Within a week, they could see remarkable change. Um, the kids, they saw how weak the kids were because day one, they could barely get through day one. The one-handed drills without a lot of breaks. They got strong, but still aren't strong enough. What do you think I should focus more on, form or speed? Both of those kind of go hand in hand. With, with having this heavy bat, if you move slow, it's going to pull you down. So we have to move fast, and we have to move direct. So again, we just want to focus on that hand and just driving that knob. How far can I drive the hand past the ball towards the pitcher? And again, it's got to be with a little bit of speed. Otherwise, it's going to fall. The bat's going to collapse. Hands are going to drop. We've got to be real direct and get that knob inside the ball. And it's these drills are something that they've never done before. So they're using muscles they've never used before in the swing as well. So they're going to be sore. Uh, after the first week of doing these drills. So just mm -hmm. keep that in mind. Like I said, they're not hurt or injured. They're just sore because they haven't right. used they're this muscle in the swing. Yep. yep. Another one here. This one's good. We have been in the program for 10 months now. Son has gotten pretty good at the drills. I believe you stress on the two and twos to give 110% effort. Should I do the same um, when going to the other drills? Yes, once you get a better grasp on them. I mean, I know we'd watch Trey doing these drills. When we do these drills now with the players that we have, the kids that have a good understanding of what they're doing and how to perform a good swing, it's all they got. We're trying to be as fast and loose and as efficient as we can be because, again, the more you swing this heavy bat, the stronger you're getting. You're always trying to improve your strength and your bat speed. So once you get a good mechanics or good mechanics and good muscle memory, everything is 110% trying to keep good mechanics. And I also want to say, you know, he's been doing this for 10 months. Um, like I said, we want to keep building that consistency. You know, I did these drills every day for like six years. And the reason I did that is because it worked. You know, like I, said, I have a lot of players that they go through the program, they see all the results, then they just stop doing the drills. When they stop doing the drills, it's miraculous. They start going through a slump. So I'm like, well, when's the last time you did the drills? Oh, well, you know, it's been about a month or two ago. Well, there's your problem right there. You know, it's just like if you want to get strong, you go to the gym, you lift weights over and over again to keep getting stronger, Right. If you stop going to the gym, you're going to lose all that muscle. You're going to lose all that strength. It's the same when you're doing these drills. Whenever you're hit, you know, if you don't continuously do them, you're going to lose that ability. So right. I said he's been doing it for 10 months now. Just keep going at it. 
keep getting more consistent. Like I said, uh, I got to the point where I would go through whole buckets. We're talking 50, 75 balls, and I wouldn't mess up once. And if I did, I started over again. So I would strove for that. I'm not going to say perfection. No one's perfect, but I wasn't leaving that cage, so I was satisfied that day, if that makes sense. So like I said, strive for perfection, and you're going to get really close. Any other questions? We had a question right here about the video, but I see that we already answered that one. Um, if you're uploading videos, those will be in Facebook or the text hotline. So a couple different options right there. Yeah, the, the text, the easiest way to get a video to us is the text hotline. I mean, you literally just text the video to us. Um, but if you can also upload on the Facebook group. So you have access to a private Facebook group. All you got to do is just create a new post and just link that video into the post and post it to the wall. We moved the insider to you around, but it sounds like most of the time should be on the outside corner, right? That is correct. Um, if so, have the T, the front part of the plate or deeper in uh, deeper on the plate, talking the two and twos with the one hander and trainer, as well as the two and twos with the trainer and game bat. We always want to keep the, the stem of the ball, the ball set, the T stem that we have right there in line with the front foot. Don't look too much, worry too much about the actual base of the T. The bases are built that way to be sturdy and to hold the position whenever you take a swing. So line that front foot up with the uh, ball on the tee and then have it positioned more towards the, out, the outside corner rather than middle. Um, that doesn't mean, again, once you get into the second half, uh, part two and all that kind of stuff, you're going to start moving the tee around anyways. But especially in the 30-day program and whenever we're just kind of going through mechanics and trying to re refine mechanics, we always – put that tee on the outside part of the plate and just gear towards that way because again that's the pitch you're going to see most of the time early on in your career if you can hit that pitch solid and drive that ball the other way you're going to be one of the best hitters on your team as you grow and as you get bigger and stronger you'll develop out and be able to start pulling the ball but again we want to gear towards the opposite field and the main reason we put the tee on the up uh, on the outside part of the plate is because during the 30-day program, we're teaching one thing. We're teaching you how to stay inside the ball, okay? And the only way that you can stay inside the ball on an outside pitch is by – or the only way that you can drive that pitch to the opposite field gap on the outside is by staying inside the ball. So if you're doing these drills, you set the tee up on the outside part of the plate and you hit a ball up the middle, well, you know I came around that ball, okay? You can make an adjustment right then and there. And then you can focus on hitting that hard line drop to the opposite field gap, if that makes sense. So whenever I'm working with a player, I could tell what they're doing wrong just by looking at the flight of the ball. If you're coming around, if you're coming around the ball, you're hitting it back up the middle. Uh, if your front shoulder is flying off, I can see that there's side spin on the ball to the opposite field. I always want to see that good back spin to the opposite field gap while doing these drills because we're teaching you how to stay inside the ball and how to get the good extension through it. Yeah, very good. Um, another one here. Thanks again, guys. As of yesterday, 54 to 68 in 10 months. That's awesome, dude. That's awesome. 14 Jesus. miles an hour in 10 months. <laughs> That's crazy. That's awesome. How old is he? Tell me again. I think you told me that earlier. But I am curious. I want to know how old he is. 14 ain't nothing. 14 miles an hour ain't nothing to sneeze out there. No. <laughs> Um, when we watch the videos and Trey is doing the one-handed drills, he sets the ball up near his front foot or near his front leg on the outside of the plate for the kids. Bats, they seem shorter. They can't reach the outside of the plate without casting the bat. Can we move? Yes. With the one-hander, obviously it's going to be a little shorter, yep. so you're going to have to creep up just a little bit and cut that distance down just a touch. Um, yep. As they go through it, they'll be able to stand in the same position that they hit that one-hander and take the two-hander and hit the ball exactly just the same because they've learned how to stay inside the pitch. You could throw them and bust them in, but they know how to stay inside. They can keep their hands inside. Another one here, is there a program 2.0? Yes, there is. Um, All-American Program Part 2. You can find that on the website. We'll grab that link and post that in the chat here in just a second as well. So if you don't have that, you can go purchase that. It's on the, and it's on, a, on the membership side as well. Like I said, if you go you, where, where you get your part one, 
you'll see there's a tab there for part two as well, but it's locked. Uh, all you gotta do is click on upgrade and it'll unlock it for you. Um, is there a diagram of where to place the T-stem for different drills? Uh, there is a picture that we've posted in the Facebook group um, where we basically lay the T down and we show you how far away, where the front foot is. And we've kind of drawn some different lines and things to give you a better idea of what the positioning should look like. Um, so again, if you have questions about that, you can text the hotline, we'll send that picture to you or message us uh, via email and Brian will send that, that picture to you as well. All right, come there next week, Jonathan. Help me remember, uh, we'll do a video on that. What's that? On the T placement? You get yeah. that question. So whenever yeah. I, yeah, when I come there next week, let's, let's shoot a video on that. Yeah, that'll work. You get a lot um, of questions about that. The kid who's seen 14 miles an hour just turned 12. Wow. Wow. 68 miles an hour at 12? Or 11? Yeah. Basically 11. He just turned 11. Uh, if we do That's too much work good, on the right? outside corner, will an inside strike handcuff my guy? Not once they learn how the lower half properly works. Again, once we train our hands to stay inside the pitch on the outside, we get into the lower half, which gives us a better opportunity, teaches us how to get our body in position to keep our hands inside that inside pitch. Um, Trey talks about the approach all the time. Frank would gear him, gear and plan to go to right center and react to everything on the inside corner. The inside corner is going to be like squat and flies to players. They just have to see it. They have to see it and react to it. And you do that in the cage and BP and things like that. Um, so don't worry about that. Don't, a lot of folks say that, uh, some of this is inside out. What we're teaching you is not an inside out swing. If your ball is tailing to the right side or to the opposite field, that's inside out. Everything we're teaching is backspin, line drives, hard hit balls to the opposite field gap. That's what you want. Um, that kind of swing is going to play and last longer for your player than, than worrying about the inside pitch. The inside pitch is going to come. And the swing, is, like whenever we're working on a swing, it's a progression. Okay, so the first 30 days, we're teaching players how to stay inside the ball. That is it, okay? So, like I said, we set everything up on the outside part of the plate because that's the only way that we can teach how to stay inside the ball. I mean, it's really easy for us to be able to make adjustments right away because just by, from the flight of the ball, I can tell if he's staying inside the ball or not. So, once they get consistent staying inside the ball, and once we get into the part two of the program, we start moving that T around. All right, we start doing middle pitches and hitting the ball back up the middle, and we start working on inside pitches and pulling the ball. But the difference between an outside pitch and the inside pitch is just what the lower half does. The lower half rotates more on the inside pitch than it does on the outside pitch, okay? But the hands do the same thing. The hands, no matter what, we want to stay inside the ball, okay? So if they're thrown inside, I want them to pull that ball to the, you know, the mm -hmm. pull gap okay so for me i'm a righty so you throw me inside my my objective is to stay inside that ball and hit it to the left center field gap okay so we're not teaching you to hit everything opposite field that's not what we want but we do want you to stay inside the ball every swing mm -hmm. uh, using the team package with our boys next week not enough bat and left one-handers to take home for everyone should we have the boys just do the four drills with the regular bat and then rotate to using the cam wood the following week at home? Of course, we would uh, advise parents to get their own set. Um, truthfully, I, I don't think it's a bad – I mean, obviously, we want we want the kids to get their own set. If they get their own set, they can go home and do it by themselves. But have them work with you because, again, the stuff that you're going to teach them through watching the videos and all that kind of stuff, it's going to give them time to go home and think about it. Think about how that's really affecting their swing how it really does make a lot more sense than people give it credit for and work while they're there. Um, again, it's all about the progression. You don't want to necessarily just hurry up and get all the drills done and hurry up and get through the 30 days. We want to progress and improve while we're progressing. So I'd probably just have them stay with me and encourage them all to get their own set and go home and, and continue the program by themselves. I said, the main thing is we want to make sure the kids are doing the drills properly, okay? Because mm -hmm. if you go home and you work on a bad – like if you're doing the drills wrong – Yeah, you're doing you're this. Developing doing a bad other. habit. Yeah. You know, that's 
not beneficial to the player. All right, we want to have them in an environment where they can understand the drills and do them properly. And that's why mm-hmm. uh, we have a travel ball coach that does this with his entire organization. And uh, three times a week, they come to him for practice. Well, he's working with them, teaching them the drills those three days. And whenever they're not practicing, the players are at home doing the drills, right? So he teaches them the drill at practice, watches them, corrects them there. And then it's the player's job to go home and do the drills on his own properly from what he just learned from his coach mm-hmm. at practice. But the thing is, is if they get their own sets, they're got the parent and the player are going to have access to us as well. Okay. So they're able to text the hotline. They're able to um, message the Facebook group. So there are, um, avenues that they can get coaching to make sure they're doing the drills mm-hmm. properly while at home. And even you, if like if you're the coach, you can set up a text group to where they can post videos of them doing the drills to you and you can critique them or a Facebook group or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways that they can get the proper instruction. Um, but the key to this program and these drills are repetition, obviously. You know, we don't want to just do this one time a week. We want this to become a routine. Okay. So consistency and repetition is how we're going to get better through this program. Um, I think this was just a comment here. Makes sense. Hitting coach says the same thing that my son easily handles the inside stuff, and he agrees it's all about hitting the outside corner um, to the right or to right center. That's all he talks about. In addition to our Camwood work at home, he uses our Camwood equipment with my son in there once a week. Uh, session that's awesome again the more you can get this involved i mean into your hitting coach's hands or if you still have hitting coaches and things like that it's not that we're trying to i mean change their way of thinking what we have found is the simplest way to do it and teach it and perform it so share this program i mean share the knowledge that you're getting send other people to us because again we're only making the game better we're only making your kids better um it's just going to get more competitive and more fun to watch as these kids get older and they grow up and they, some of them make it to college and big leagues and things like that. So. And that's the thing that I love is, you know, we don't reinvent the wheel. We didn't come up Mm -mm. with this. Okay. We, we learned this from players like Tony Gwynn, Rod Carew, you know, some of the greatest hitters of all time. So we learned their knowledge and it's just been passed down to us. All right. We didn't, make this up and come out of nowhere and you know start using off the wall stuff to try to teach a swing i mean Mm -hmm. i've i've seen some crazy stuff what people are doing out there that little the noodle going up to up in the air yeah you see me share that (laughs) yeah that that was was but and again i mean we don't we don't get into knocking stuff like that i mean we see stuff and we laugh at it to ourselves but to each his own. We know what we believe and the folks like you that are coming in and that are following this and they're getting involved and seeing the results for yourself, nobody's ever going to be able to change your mind on this. No coach, no player, no nobody. So your kid now has the knowledge to hit for themselves. They give their self the own opportunity to make their adjustments in game without the ability of anybody else telling them what they need to do. They're the ones swinging. They're the ones that really felt what happened and what didn't happen in that swing. And if they know the stuff that we're teaching, they're going to be so much better. They're going to be so much better. Here's another one. One of our two and two drills is the one-hander and trainer to stay inside the ball and the other uh, trainer and game bat um, to increase bat speed. How would we incorporate our heavy 31-28 ash bat? Start using that just like the game bat. The more they swing the cam wood, they're going to get stronger. (laughs) Um, they're getting stronger. Give them a heavier bat. They swing it just like a game bat. We talk, I mean, Trey mentions this all the time. The heavier the bat is, if you have good mechanics, it does not matter what the weight is. If you move the right direction, everything's going to naturally take over and stay in line with that ball because we're talking about the concept of a straight line. And that's never going to change. So, again, pick that 31-inch, that drop three up, and swing it just like he'd swing his other game bat. Yeah, I would I would use that in the progressions of the, the bat speed drills. The so two and twos. do the two and twos, do two cam wood, two of the heavy wood bat that you have and keep alternating. And then, um, you know, maybe at the end of the session, do two two and twos, two cam wood, two heavy bat, two regular bat, 
and then keep alternating those. Um, mm -hmm. That would be a really good drill for him as well, because he'll be able to really feel, you know, how light and how easy that barrel just whips through the zone with his actual game bat um, at the end of it. I know me personally, um, whenever I used to do this drill, my heavy was a 100 ounce bat and my light bat was my 64 ounce cam wood. So that's how I did the bat speed drill throughout my entire college career. I never even used the game bat. Is Georgia going to win one day? <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that, that's an easy question. Oh. No, no comment. Man, nobody's saying nothing to you, man. <laughs> nobody's saying nothing. Nobody say nothing. Very good. Any other questions, guys? This has been great today. It's been very good. This is, I mean, this is why we do it. We want to help you see the best results you can possibly see from going through this program. Is Georgia going to win one day? What kind of question is that? Jesus. Hmm. All right, folks. Well, if that's all the questions that we have, again, you are always welcome to text the hotline. Find that number in the program. Um, and if you don't have it, I've posted it in here. We'll type it in here again so you can see it. Looks like couple folks uh he said i hope kirby will be smart amen um thank you guys thank you thank you hey thank no, you all no no pun intended <laughs> yeah maybe he'll be smart <laughs> we appreciate all of you guys continue to go through the program text us if you have questions hit us up in the facebook group and share this with somebody if you have a friend that is struggling to hit or a friend that has a kid that's struggling to hit give this knowledge away share it with them bring them into this community and help them see the same results that your kids are seeing we appreciate it, guys. We'll see you next Thursday at 1 o'clock. Y'all have a great week. Thank you, guys.